the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast, Episode 6. There are hundreds of small ways you can improve your task management. Just do a Google search. But to be efficient, we want to focus our efforts on those changes which make the biggest difference so we don't waste time, energy, and money. The question, how do we determine which changes are more important than others? What if we view our task management as a system rather than a set of disconnected parts? Does that make a difference? Tune into this episode of the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast to listen to me and my special guest, Art Gelwicks, as we solve this challenging problem together. Welcome to the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast. And welcome back to the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast. And as you can see, I have a special guest. I'm going to introduce you to him in just a moment. And before I do that, I want to remind you that this is a problem and solution podcast where we come up with a problem that we think is tricky, sticky, popular, and hard to solve. And we go at it hammer and tongs until we come up with some answers. And as we roll out some answers that we are hoping no one has ever heard of before, unique insights, you'll hear a bell. And if we don't, you'll hear a buzzer at the end of the episode that says that, oh, well, we tried. We didn't really get anywhere. But thanks for listening. <laughs> okay. So before I introduce Art, let me just tell you a quick story. Anne has been a hardcore productivity enthusiast for about a year, ever since she completed an online training and started to make some serious improvements. At first, she made some great progress, monumental progress, and lots of people noticed the difference within just a matter of weeks. Her boss actually said to her, you know, you're more focused nowadays. And her husband was happy to know to tell her that she was never, ever late, I guess, comparing to how it was before. She's really eager to continue to make improvements because guess what? She's going to be adopting twin girls in the next few months. They're two-year-olds and she's, gonna, she's thinking they're going to be pretty demanding. So she's kind of being proactive and she's in preparation for their arrival. She wants to make some improvements so that she's not totally caught off guard. She wants to make some improvements so that she can sort of pave the way for what's going to be a dramatic increase in tasks or what we call on this podcast, time demands. But she's a very, very diligent person. She's browsed the internet. She has a list of four task management apps she'd like to try. She's also found a cool planner. She's also downloaded a time tracking program. And she has nine articles saved up, which has, which together they have 27 new habits or practices to implement. She hasn't started reading them yet, but now she's feeling like she's, as if she's a little bit overloaded. She's now into a bit of analysis paralysis. Where should she start? Because the truth is, she can't possibly go down all these rabbit holes. If she did, maybe the teens might make it to college by the time she got there, and <laughs> it would have been a fruitless, fruitless <laughs> wasted effort. So I've introduced you to my guest for this episode, Art Gellwix. He's an experienced technology and productivity consultant, podcaster, and blogger, including shows such as Cross Platform and the site The Idea Pump. And he's my colleague from the Productivity Cast podcast. Art. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Francis. This, this is going to be a fun exercise, if nothing else, because it's got a lot of reality mixed in with a lot of theories. So, Yeah, it's going to, I'm, I'm, I'm watching my time carefully to make sure we don't go too far out, but let's start by stating sort of the initial challenge that someone like Anne has, you know, when you, especially when you're a beginner, there's a lot of people telling you, right, that this is what you should be doing over here. And somebody else tells you, oh, this is what you should be downloading over here. And there's lots of compelling cases, bright, shiny objects all around the, your world telling you that this is what you should do next or first or instead, or you shouldn't have done that. You should have done this. And it's a bit of information overload, don't you think? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, when you look at what she's accomplished so far, and she has had some success, as, as you've outlined. 
and she's gotten positive reinforcement that she's had that success, that's a motivating factor to say, hey, I can take on more, I can do more. But what she's not done so far, and I don't, I don't want to go into fixing the problem, but she hasn't defined the problem. Uh, one of the things I always talk with people about is what's your success criteria? What's going to make you think that you were successful? And when I think about her story, she's really got three main problem areas. One, maintaining the success she's seen so far. Second, tackling all these new potential tools and concepts and avenues to improve that success. But three, probably the most important of them is the introduction of these two little twin chaos factors that are gonna <clears throat> turn things upside down and sideways just by their own existence. That becomes the challenge because everything from a systemic standpoint has been defined around a specific set of problems so far. And that set of problems is now completely different. And she's not exactly, most of us, not, not to pick on Anne in particular, but most of us aren't geared to tackle these open-ended kinds of improvement opportunities, right? You know, we, we, we come into kindergarten and we're told that first grade is next. And all the way up through graduation from, some people graduation from, you ever talk to a medical school student? <laughs> they're like, they, don't, they don't finish until sometime in their thirties. And every year has been programmed from the age of four to the age of like 35 or something like that. Mm -hmm. That time they add on residences and fellowships and this and that. And it's all like they're following a formula. And for most of us, our learning and development and our growth comes from a formula that someone else has laid out for us, right? It's, it's, we're told, we're given some choice along the way, but when we make a choice, it's, it's, it's often a case of locking onto another path. So there, a path is presented to us and we're told, okay, lock onto that, lock onto that one if you want to become an engineer at the end of it or an architect or whatever it may be. So it, we're, we're presented in life with lots of fixed paths. We're, we're, we're not given these open-ended kinds of challenges, right? Now, this is one of those things where we've got basically a change of life event incorporated in with a consistency of life. So everything she's built up to this point, everything about her operation on a daily basis has been built around a repeating sequence of events. She gets up in the morning, she goes through her day's activities, normal things happen. Mm -hmm. She's able to plan and accommodate for that. And I'm, I'm guessing that she has a system both, both personally and professionally that she's cultivated to a certain degree to work within that time frame. Well, now we've got a change of life event. In this case, it's the addition of two little people. That's going to totally reset the environment because that creates an interrupt-driven environment that your existing systems just aren't built to handle. It's not that they can't. It's just that you never define them with that included as part of the execution. And it, it could be, you know, we keep talking about the, the introduction of the, two, the two-year-olds. That's fine. Could be winding up having to take care of a, you know, an elderly parent or a major relocation. Any sort of a life change event does force you to take that step back and say, can what I have now handle this and the impacts that this is going to have on the way I've been doing things? And unfortunately, I, I hear this story far too often because immediately you start to get inundated with the common wisdom of, oh, do this thing, get this planner, try this system, try this tool, this and that and the other thing, especially if you start to indicate to people that you're get you're developing anxiety or stress around this new challenge immediately everybody wants to solve your problem including yourself and they think there's an easy way to solve it and 
this type of thing, I think to start, you must give yourself permission to understand that you do not understand the, the problem right away. You have to take that time to define what is your success criteria? What's, what will make you happy at the end of the day? But, but to Anne's credit though, she, she, her foresight is kind of unusual, right? Because most people I know, it's, it, it's six months after the fact and you can barely recognize mm -hmm. them. They look like they're dying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't know what hit them. It happens a lot when people get promoted, I notice. Mm -hmm. Six months after the promotion, they're Absolutely. like the walking dead. They, are, they have it's like they no got idea. Hit by a truck. They have no idea. They have no idea what they're walking into. They're not prepared for it. Right. And I and I would say that Anne's probably on the other side of that, the, the other right. extreme and swing of the pendulum. She's almost overcompensating for it. Right. So she knows this what the tsunami is headed her way so instead of just you know getting in a boat and getting ready to ride it out for a little while she's busy trying to build a bunker and put sandbags down and she's trying to do everything possible without understanding how big the tsunami is that's headed her direction so this type of thing again there's nothing wrong with doing this preparatory work I mean, to go through and, and identify these types of tools and solutions, that's great. If it makes you feel more confident knowing that there are potential options, gather them. I think the gathering part's great, but feeling, com feeling compelled to implement this early in the process, uh, I don't know. I, I, I really think she's going to have a significant challenge to uproot her system and have all these things crawl into play. I, I think it's really going to be more, more stress than it's worth. And what worries me in this, and you've seen it too, is when people go down this path of, of overcompensating and then it doesn't meet expectations or it falls by the wayside, mm -hmm. it takes their existing system with it. So it's not just the new stuff that falls off. They don't get back to, to ground zero. Right. They wound up below ground. Right. And that's a because now you have to crawl back to where you were. And I would not be shocked if you look at this story six months down the road and she's having a review meeting with her manager saying, hey, you backslid from all the progress you made. Right. And it could very well be because she's tried to change her system. She's tried to compensate for everything and all these possibilities. And when, when you look at all those bits crying and, pieces, and everything, <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really tough. Cause you start to look at all those individual pieces. How do I take care of this? How do I take care of that? How do I take care of the other thing? And that's where we started talking about this. Do you look at the whole picture or do you look at the smaller pieces? She, she, again, to her credit, she not credit, but in this particular situation, she actually has a time frame, So she mm -hmm. has a few months before the tsunami hits. This isn't, you know, a diagnosis of a disease that you now need to go to have surgery for that came out of the blue. This is something planned and intentional. So she, in this particular circumstance, she knows something is coming. But I, I think for most people and in most circumstances, they've not thought about it. They're not giving it a second thought the way she has. And they have no benefit of foresight. They don't know they didn't see it coming they didn't like the pandemic no one knew it was coming no one saw it happen no one saw it happening mm -hmm. it just came upon us and it brought well this this part comes to her credit perhaps is that she she is to some degree aware of her task management system she's aware that there's something mm -hmm. that she wants to work on most people, for most people, they're not aware of task management explicitly, and they're not aware that it's a, there's any systematic anything going on. Is that is that true to say? No, you're absolutely right. This is the type of thing where, and to give to give her and people of her ill credit, she is aware that change is coming, and she is aware that she has to prepare for that change. I'll be honest with you, that's half the battle, to be cognizant of the fact that that 
is headed your direction and where you stand currently may not be enough to weather that change, that's a big step because then you're not getting caught on your back foot. Building from that, mm -hmm. looking at it now at the granular level to say, okay, what am I doing now and how does it scale? And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the key things that she started to look at right away is scalability of her system. Mm -hmm. You know, can, can the alternatives handle this increased load or this dynamically changing load? Mm -hmm. That's the second step in the right direction mm -hmm. is understanding that whatever volume of work and tasks I think I have now, it's going up. It's mm -hmm. going to go up significantly unless, and this may be something, you know, when you and I talk about this with a coaching perspective for people, mm -hmm. one of the other ways to look at this is, well, if your task level can't go up, some of these tasks have to replace others. So you have to have some that come out of the mix and get rid of. You wind up having to drop off some things. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people, especially in today's mindset, will go through and say, no, I'm going to do it all. I'm mm -hmm. going to keep doing all the things I've been doing, and I'm going to add more to it. And that's where we get into burnout and anxiety and stress and all the, the mental, emotional factors that come into play with being productive as well. Right. Especially if they go from, from having a lot of spare time, which I've seen happen, they have, they have, they have a lot of discretionary time to the point where their new, whatever commitment they, commitments they now have that are new consumes all of that spare time. So now they're in a deficit. So their practice, for example, of waking up late on Saturday and kind of just meandering through the day with no clear plans and doing whatever, those get obliterated and they now have to sacrifice in their mind Saturdays because mm -hmm. they now need to actually think about it. And just thinking about it for some people feels like a burden. Like I shouldn't have to think about Saturday. I shouldn't have to think about Sunday. I shouldn't have to think about a vacation day. I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't be forced to. I should be able to kind of like go back to the way things were before with my old practices. So she, yeah, she's, she's steps ahead, but for most people, hmm. She, she is steps ahead in the mechanical part, mm -hmm. but I don't know that she's necessarily steps ahead in what I want to say, the, the emotional intelligence part of it, that mm -hmm. the impact this is about to have on her personally mm -hmm. from the change in the system. And mm -hmm. we see this mm -hmm. a lot when people, even without a significant life change, will have a change in their system. They decide to flip tools, for example. Well, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, three weeks later, you know, their hair's on fire because it's not working the same way it was. Mm -hmm. Well, the tool mm -hmm. is probably doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. but your comfort level with how it does that now mm -hmm. has not reached the point where you can let it go on autopilot. You can take advantage of mm -hmm. those automations and, the, and that flow state that you feel. Mm -hmm. with your this implementation type of wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the best. Your, your it, expectation of how fast it should make this yeah. difference is off. It's, it's built to handle life as it is. And this is, we talk about, again, we talk about this all the time, future proofing your solutions, looking at something, whatever you're going to decide on and say, will this continue to work for me over time? And, and I'll call out something specific, like the planner. We've talked about analog planners, mm -hmm. you know, ad infinitum. They work to a degree, but they don't scale to volume very well. Mm -hmm. And that's where it may feel like a safety valve. Oh, I can get a paper planner. I can keep this with me. I can, and that's great, but you're going to hit that ceiling really fast. So if you ever see those ads for planners, the, the person always has like five tasks. And there's a reason yeah, why. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. You know, that's that type of thing becomes a challenge. And when, when we think about this narrative, she has all these things now to evaluate. We know that's all time consuming. Every one of those task management applications to evaluate has a set of tasks to do 
to do the evaluation. Right. So you've added work onto yourself just to evaluate whether or not something is going to be useful to you in the long run. The articles you need to read and consume and process, this is all additional work. Is it going to fit into what you have? And we're really at a point in the world where we need to be focusing on working less, not working more. So I say, that's interesting. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label that insight number one. Oh, did you hear that? There oh. we go. Oh. <laughs> hey, that's a good one. I'll take a bell. I'll take a bell. That's take right. a bell for that one. The reason, so. the, reason I, the reason I'm saying that is that any productivity solution is kind of like a puppy. Yeah. There, there's one thing to bring in a puppy, and they're really small, and they're really cute. And then they grow up and become monsters sometimes. Mm -hmm. Some definitely do. And you got to walk them and you got to this and you got to that. And you gotta, if you're not doing what you said, if you're not thinking ahead in terms of the solution that you're implementing, because when I, when I was thinking of this program, I was only thinking of the things you need to change, but you've added in the element of the things you need to implement because mm -hmm. they have a life of their own. They have a useful, let's say a, a useful, a useful life before mm -hmm. you need to upgrade them, before you need to manage them, and before you need to um, uh, keep them. Like, for example, people who get a smartphone are, 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 for the first time, are shocked at the amount of, this is going back in the day, but we're shocked at the amount of work it takes to maintain a smartphone. That's a, I was actually reading yeah. that. The famous, it's, the a, famous, it's a pocket computer. It's a pocket computer. And that's, and let's, you, let's use you that gotta as You got to do stuff to keep it going. Let's use that as a perfect example. When you change out a phone, you upgrade from one to another. There is work that has to be done to transition. You cannot avoid it. So let's go back to the narrative a little bit. You were talking about her having a total of 27 new habits to implement. Now we know we've talked about a habit takes anywhere from three to six months to make a reality. Mm -hmm. So for the next three to six months, you're going to try to implement 26 or 27 new habits while also corralling two little tornadoes in your house and maintaining the same operative level you had before. If you can do that, more power to you, but I'm not hedging my bets on that. I think you're going to wind up with more stress and pain. So you have to start to say, what is reasonable? What is the, and again, I don't want to go ahead into solving the problem, but understanding that maybe not this much change at once is necessary. Right. We off, right. Change should not happen for change's sake. Change right. should happen to improve success. But we're, we're, we're brought up in a world though, right? In which we, we, we aren't trained to, to see systems. Systems True. happen to us. <laughs> after the fact <laughs> but we're mm -hmm. not trained to to appreciate you know there's no as far as i remember even as an engineer that kind of training didn't come until late in my career um or late in my training i would say it did come but it came it didn't come in you know up to maybe fresh uh, sophomore year the idea that you're dealing with a system and dealing with a system is very different than dealing with a, a piece part but we're not trained in our regular everyday way of thinking to deal with, mm -hmm. for in, in the case of this discussion, task management as a system. We're trained to, to, to say, okay, well, use this app and see what happens. If, if, if you were to picture it as a Venn diagram, I always look at the traditional system as a, a three component system, which is your task management, your calendar, and your note system that those three components comprise the lion's share of what you need to do from uh, an operational management system for personal or professional. So if you look at the overlap, you've got you know tasks to calendars, tasks to notes, that's great. But within each one of those circles is its own ecosystem of things that have to happen. And we look at tools, we look at things like you know, applications like Todoist, for example, those are big systems. They have a lot of capacity and a lot of capability. 
And you have to learn the tool, you learn the solution, decide how it will work for you and how it won't and adapt it accordingly. That's all effort that has to go into play. That's not something that we can just flip a switch. And you're right, we're in a societal mindset where I should be able to download an app that solves my problem. Mm -hmm. Well, none of these individual little apps do that because as soon as you have an app that, that does one thing really well, mm -hmm. the immediate feedback is, well, can you make it do this? Can you make it do this other thing? And then you wind up with this big sprawling systemic app. So you're right. Which almost viewing, all of them become. Viewing our thing, our, our product, productivity platforms, however mm -hmm. we've, com we've built them as a system and how those systemic components interact and how we manage them really defines the success or the failure of our own systems. Uh, the analogy that comes, the, the visualization that comes to mind, if you imagine going to a marionette show or a puppet show and the puppeteers above the, the marionettes and he's making them dance and making them move around the stage. Well, each one of those marionettes is your tool. Mm -hmm. You're the puppet master. And you have to know if I move it this way and move it that way, it does this thing or that thing to create an end effect. We often look at ourselves integrated into just one part of this and it, we're not, we're integrated into the entire spectrum. I call it, call it let's, this is probably the time to transition then into the solution, which is to see yourself as the puppeteer and mm -hmm. you choose, you have choice over the number of puppets, what the puppets do. You can't, you probably don't design the puppets. So I think the point that you made before, it, it rang out, it ran true for me with some task management apps, which have focused more on adding long tail features. Let's just call it that to be, mm -hmm. be generous. Yeah. Features that very few people will ever discover. And they're all way out in the long tail, meaning that there's only a small number of them who will ever use them. And they'll only use them in rare occasion. There's a couple of apps I'm, I'm thinking of right now, which have oh, added yeah. new features. I, I, it, I, I started to begin to understand them, but I put them on a, to -do, on a, on a list to do later. Maybe not even ever but they're designed and, in. And when you come into the system, you, you, you're forced to ask yourself the question, do I really need to know that feature? Or is that so far out on the tail that it will be 10 years before I'm even, it's even worthy of consideration based on my life? There, there's, in all the years I've been teaching, one of the things I've told people all the time is it is more important to know a feature exists than it is to know how to do it. Because you can always go back and figure out how to do something. You can look it up, you can find the help text, you can find a YouTube video, whatever. If you're aware a feature exists, you're in a better state. Because if you don't know it exists at all, you'll never have a reason to go find out how to do it. Right. But if you're aware it's there, you can decide, I may never use that feature. It's nice, it's, it's a nice function, but I have no purpose for it. It has no benefit for me now. But should that become the case later on, right. let's say for example, in, as part of our narrative, one of the things I, I wind up having now is a lot of recurring tasks. Right. You know, I have the, the, two, the two year olds have a recurring play date every third Wednesday at 4 p.m. Well, my system now has to be able to handle that kind of crazy, odd time logic. Mm -hmm. So whether it's my calendar that's going to do that for me, whether it's my task system that's going to do that for me, something has to handle that part of it because I got enough to think about. And I have to be able to trust this system to be able to handle that piece of information. And if I know those features are there, I can then go back and find it. But if I don't know they exist at all, I'm going to be frustrated and likely prob try to do this with something that's not designed to do it. It's, I go back to the old analogy. I've seen people use Excel as a word processor. Certain tools are not designed to do certain <laughs> jobs. Yes, yes, I, it's true. Stop. It's true. Matter of fact, it goes all the way back to the old Lotus one, two, three days. I've seen that too. Um, but, but, you know, and, you know and 
Anne has the, the, the challenge because she can't, she can't know what all these tools do. She no, can't know she can't. the ramifications of all these 27 habits. She can't know the, ta the, 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 the meaning of you no know, gathering time and tracking her time using the, the timer. She can't, she can't know the, the, the limits. So she can't know everything. But at least she is kind mm -hmm. of cognizant that there's something, there's something that she needs to be to account for. All right. So as we pivot to the answer, so the, the, the argument is that she needs to see her system as a system and not yeah. make the mistake of um, seeing it as not, as not, I guess not, most people who don't see their system as a system don't know that a system exists for anybody. They, they're not able There's, to see the connections. They don't. They, they see activity, but no yeah. connections. There's there's two keys to it. Mm -hmm. One rule: never throw out the system because it doesn't solve a specific problem. That's that's the first rule. Because if you let's say for example, if we use a car analogy, mm -hmm. if if you can't haul five people in your car, you don't throw the car out because it can still work for you. It can do other things for you. It just, in that one unique case, it's not solving the problem. But often when we look at productivity systems, we look at the tool we're using and it can't do something. We immediately start running to find another tool that will do that thing. Yes, we do. There's, there's we do. it's the old, you know, baby with the bathwater analogy. You, you don't want to do that. Right. But the second part, and I think this is probably the more critical piece is, there are two ends to the spectrum. There's the easiest way to solve a problem immediately. And then there's the best way to solve a problem. So let's take, for example, my recurring task thing. We've got the play date scheduled on the, on the third Wednesday. That's great. Mm -hmm. The easiest way is just to write that down somewhere. Mm -hmm. Just write it down in a note, write it down in a plan or something like that. Capture it and deal with it. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Move on. The best way is to integrate it in your system, to use as a tool that has actual reminders on it, can do the scheduling notification. That's all great. But we have this mindset nowadays of things have to be either or. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a that is a notion that that is a mental construct that needs to be completely de deconstructed because you can have both. Mm -hmm. You can start from that initial capture so that it doesn't get lost and then build it up to that best perfect solution. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a split. There's nothing, there's no rule that says that. Mm -hmm. You can watch as many YouTube videos, listen to as many podcasts. Anybody who's telling you it must be one or the or other, the other. Mm -hmm. is selling you something. So but that's the that's the this is the problem with with the the, the, the two. The two aspects that you just outlined, the throwing the baby out with the bathwater and then thinking that you can't have easiest and best coexisting. Because as an app developer, what I would do is I would try to sell you that those two are not true or they are true. I would tell you the mm -hmm. version that serves me that, yes, you know, you can't do that with this. And there are, there are whole books written saying that you can't do that and this at the same time. You need to do this only. And if you're not successful, it's because you haven't implemented enough of this. You haven't gotten rid of enough of that. So there are people who have that point of view and they push it hard. And sure. then there are other people who say that when you're using best, you will not use easiest or you should not use easiest because that creates problems and you really should. Like, for example, if I'm selling you a system that does recurring, puts recurring items in your calendar, this should replace, this should become your capture tool. <laughs> So what I could say, this is, you should capture straight into it. And okay, if, let's... if you buy the argument and buy the tool, then you say, okay, I'm going to follow the instructions. But that comes from let's... a kind of a buying what you're being sold, which is not, I don't see the, I don't see app developers or anybody selling planners or any of the solutions in our space. I don't see them saying this is a complement to your already existing system. And 
that's really the challenge is that so many tools out there are systems are attempting to be turnkey systems in and of themselves. And that never works. We know that for a fact because everybody is unique and everybody is different. You and I know. So, unfortunately, most people learn that fact the hard way. Honestly, the same way we've learned it. You know, we, we've looked at enough systems that say, do it this way and you do it that way. And it works for about 80% of your things. And then all of a sudden it falls on its face. So let's take, for example, the, the capture piece. You know, it should go into your single capture and it should handle everything and your tool should do all the, yeah, everything. that's great. We know that's not going to happen because there's always going to be edge cases that break that. So we have to say, what is the problem that we're actually trying to solve? And the problem in this case is not forgetting things. Right. Well, the easiest way to not forget something is to not have to remember it in the first place. That solves the problem. Quickest solution. Can I put it somewhere that I don't have to remember? Absolutely. Could it be post-it notes on the wall? Absolutely. Are there downsides? Absolutely. So that's where we have to look at our system and say, how do I get from the quickest, dirtiest solution to closer to the best solution? And where on that spectrum am I comfortable stopping? Right. So no, let me give you, you... But you just did something real quick, real quick. Before What's that? You, don't forget that okay. point. No. You, you, you applied a bit of expert diagnosis in a, in, based on years of, and also yeah. being an, as intelligent as you are, you applied it <laughs> real you. quick. Now, somebody who's listening onto the podcast could be like, whoa, 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 whoa wait, wait, back up. And they're, they're here to rewind to say, mm -hmm. how did he get to there from here? Hold on. How did he, where did he, how did he? Mm -hmm. where, because you, you understand the root cause. Now, Anne may not know the, she may not exactly understand why she's capturing and she may not see the, the, red herring that she's being fed mm -hmm. by the app developer who says capture into this capture into your calendar directly and you don't need to capture anywhere else she may not see that but i wanted to highlight that because it, it gives me a clue as to where we're headed for Anne. is that with this filter this diagnostic filter every suggestion that comes in hits the filter and then it's like a oh, hold on a minute it's like you have an illness and you go into different mm -hmm. doctors and you're like you know you come up on one and you're you're, you're after you've been to a few, you kind of have a filter for quacks, right? Right. And this piece of advice doesn't sound like anything I've heard before. You want me to drink how many, how many glasses of water? And that'll solve yeah. the so that I have. <laughs> anyway, I, don't, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to point no, out. No, 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 no. It's you apply it, it, is it a so perfect... fast. I wanted to it outline is... it. But that's that's the thing that we have to be able to get ourselves to do is to ask very basic questions to evaluate and move on. And that right. the challenge with the systemic and analysis approach when it comes to productivity platforms is we can get so wrapped up in the system that we lose sight of the basic questions. Uh, one of the things that I, I coach everybody on that I talk to is a concept called CPR, and it has nothing to do with life-saving. It's three steps. It's capture, process, and report. If you meet those three requirements, you will address almost everything you need to do. And it sounds kind of weird because it's like, wait, report? Why would I report my to-do list to somebody? You are reporting it to someone, yourself. yourself. You're mm -hmm. quantifying your action and completion. But it's, it simplifies things down. So if we think about, let's say, for example, she's out with the twin girls, they're out in the park, they're having a nice day, and a thought occurs to her that she needs to do something, or a text comes in, and she needs to act on it. Most of the traditional systems will say, you should put this into your action. If it's under two minutes, you should deal with it now. We all know that's run realistic from an operative sense. Mm -hmm. It has to be do something with it so I can deal with it later mm -hmm. and mitigate it. Mm -hmm. I could follow those rule sets. I could say, oh, yeah, I'm going to put it in this context and I'm going to put it in this box. And I'm going to add it to this app. And meanwhile, the two little tornadoes have now run off in different directions in the park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am no longer connected to 
my environment. Mm -hmm. I am now focused on my system rather than life. Mm -hmm. So when we look at our system solutions, we look at our tools, we have to be cognizant of how do they integrate without, without deflecting the activities that are going on around us. Right, right, right. I, th I think we're going to have to, to, to wrap up after we emphasize this point because I'm going to have to fail. Because... There you go. <laughs> I got two. I'll take two. Two. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's, it, it, it's, it's a bit of expert. You're talking about expertise in understanding a system so well that you can put the system behind you. Mm -hmm. And what you're left with is with like a fast, a fast filter or a, a fast a heuristic up front. You're left with a, a quick way of making decisions that allow life to move forward. So as soon as, as soon as you see an ad for productivity app Z, it takes you two seconds to dismiss it because your, your ability to diagnose is so refined and you understand your system and you understand that this has nothing to do with the improvements I want to make so that you immediately dismiss and very quickly. So you're, you're able to separate sheep from goats, separate useful from noise from signal in just mm -hmm. like a, an instant. Yep. And that's, that's kind of where she needs to get to is kind of what I hear you saying, because and she needs to get there as fast as possible. She won't get there in the two months because that's not, that's not. By really. giving, by giving herself permission to say, no, I won't use that now. Mm -hmm. It will open so many doors for her. And that's something that we rarely gives our, give ourselves permission. To. But quantify, think about what I just said. No, I will not use that now. Right. You're allowing yourself to push it away, to revisit it later should you want to. Right. And that in itself is just naturally empowering because it, you don't have to feel like I have completely evaluated the thing. Right. I'm just it's, not going to do that now. It's what that... that that crusty old timer that you see in movies, you know, he's like a, whatever he's an expert in, or she's an expert in, somebody comes to them and, oh my God, it's still, and they're, they're explaining mm -hmm. this whole, the whole world is crashing. And they kind of go, they take a, a, a long draw of their pipe, right? Mm -hmm. hmm. And they're, they're filtering, right? Yep. And then they say, just focus on that part. And you're like, but what about this? And what about that? And what about the other? Just focus on that part and come back to me. Because what they're doing in that instance is what they're hoping you'll do at some point, which is that you'll apply all this knowledge and, and your inner insight. And then you'll be able to just very calmly and very quickly figure out the important part and separate it from the parts that aren't important. Yeah, it's... When you get yourself comfortable with asking that basic question and answering it and being satisfied with your own answer, the rest of this all starts to fall into place. And it, that naturally comes with experience, but it is also something that you can actively cultivate. So if we look at her narrative, I would say take the 27 habits that she's, tr she's thinking about putting into place push all of those off for a year. And the one habit that she should start to cult cultivate right away is evaluate a problem and decide how she's going to manage that particular problem and get into that logic cycle over and over again. Don't try and solve the problem. Don't try and do it right then. Just what is the criteria of the problem and what's the easiest way to handle it? and then move on. And easy is good. I don't know why we've gotten into this world of easy being a, you know, a, a parallel for lazy, but it's not. Simple is good. Simple is better in so many cases. Do, do the simple way and you can keep moving on with other things that you really want to do. Because it's a small audience of That's people cool. who like to play with task management tools. Third insight, right, right, right. Because she's, yeah. she's falling into that trap of yeah. adding more solutions to look into. But really, what her system would respond to is just solve one problem. Yeah. 
and solve one problem really well. No, the system, her knowledge of the system, if she has that knowledge that the old timer has, is more likely to be, uh, let's, let's say, the a Pareto effect. It's more mm -hmm. likely to be in the 20% of things that are having the 80% of, of the impact. But the, that would come with time. But at least she'd be in the game if she were to focus on the one as opposed to the, she probably had about 40, 30, 30 different things oh, yeah. that she wanted to, to change. There, all the there's, going, there's going to be a point where managing the activities is more work than the activities themselves. And that's, to parallel it, that's why corporations have middle managers who are just moving things around and not actually doing anything. Right. She is slowly working her way towards becoming a middle manager of her own world, her own which you world. don't want to do. <laughs> right. You don't want to get yourself to that state because then you're disconnecting yourself from the successes of completion and interaction and participation. She wants to stay flat, so she's managing it as good one. <laughs> so she's managing it in a kind of a lean, a lean, a lean, mean improvement machine. Yeah, I. If you want to take it from the corporate space, it's an agile. It's agile life, basically. You're looking at Too things bad. as conti continuous delivery of participating in life. So every sprint that you have a sprint may be we always think about things for a week well sprints are typically two weeks in agile but if you take it as a as a week basis well what am i getting done this week what am i getting done the next week what has to roll over that approach can be very directly applied to daily life and if we work down that path now it's not overwhelming because i'm not trying to plan out the year I may have things that are going to go on. I have big milestones that have to be reached, but I'm thinking about it in that cycle. And again, carrying over those, that terminology, you wind up with a backlog of work. What's everything that has to happen? Well, you get this ton of stuff that has to happen. Your scrum master is going to be sitting there and just pulling things in. In this week, you have so many things that you can do. These are the things that are going to get done this week. And if they didn't get done this week, it's because there was no room to do them. And, you, and that's okay. So it's a different approach mm -hmm. to daily activity. It's how we live. We just never give ourselves the opportunity, opportunity to look at things as how we live. I, 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 and it's, it's from, from what I hear you saying, some of these lessons are already in software development. Yes. They just haven't made their way into Anne's world. Anne's world is really more typical of of you said manage middle management of my own productivity yeah. improvement they just haven't migrated and they haven't gotten that far as to and and hasn't answered the question how do i manage my own improvement effectively and so that i'm prepared as best as i can given the time frame given i'm a human being given mm -hmm. given 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 she doesn't have an answer to that question and that's that's kind of what you're saying if you look at answered. Yeah, if you look at project management, it's to get to an end goal, it's to complete a project. If you look at program management, it's a bunch of simultaneous projects. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is productive life management, being able to take that and scale it from today to the day you die and, and not know when that end date is. You don't know what the target completion date is, so you have to operate in this perpetual rolling environment. And you can use a lot of those mindsets. We go back to task management. We think about the fact that our task lists are big. And we have this mindset of, oh, I rolled something over. I didn't get it done yesterday. You know, the little flag says it was due yesterday. Or even worse, the tool filters it and shows you things that are overdue. Mm -hmm. overdue. Overdue says who? Yeah. I just said I was going to do it then. Doesn't mean it actually had to be done then. So if I created a false expectation or unnecessary stress and anguish just because I gave a personal commitment to doing something then, and the only person who I'm reporting that to is myself, is yeah, we can be the hardest managers we've ever encountered. I mean, we've, gone, we've all gone through professional evaluations and things like that, but nobody is harder on us than ourselves. Right. And to be able to look at these, these things systemically 
right. and say, this is part of our just daily life cycle right? and build a system that cultivates that, we get back to that original concept. We're right. then able to work less right. and work better. So improve better. All right, you're coming back, okay? So okay. You, need to, you need to know that, but how can people get That's a hold fine. of That's fine, I'm happy to, this is great. <laughs> This is the type, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, Francis, Yeah. this is the type of exercise that needs to happen. There's I'm, so many talking head conversations. Yes. You can listen to, oh, do this, do that. You yes, can get the six yes, bits, yes. six seconds snippets on Instagram. That's fine. But yeah. to truly understand the problem, yeah. you have to integrate yourself into the thinking of the problem rather than the solution first. Right. So right. kudos Absolutely to you on right. this, on this format. Okay, great. Kudos to Anne for giving Anne is fictional, but yes, Anne's gonna do it. She's, she's gonna pull it together. So I have typical. confidence. You know, she's she gives us like the right kind of she, she's got it circumstance. She's uh, anyway. All right, how can people get a hold of you? I know you're making some changes to your ecosystem. Yeah, I've, I've got way? some changes, but it's okay. It's a good safe place. Uh, best thing to do is pop over to the idea pump, ideapump.com slash follow me. And everything that's going on, like I said, there's gonna be some big shifts going on in the very short future. Uh, but that link will still work. And from that point on, I'll be back apparently. So I'll be looking forward to that as well. And you're also on LinkedIn, of course, right? Absolutely. I want to find you there. Great. All right. I want to thank you for coming on the Task Management and Time Blocking podcast. What an awesome conversation that we got. I know many things we got, but I could have, I kept wanting to ding even more because there's so many <laughs> cool insights that came out. You're coming back. I look forward to having you back. Guys, as you're listening in, we're not done yet. A couple more notes. And Art, right, thanks for coming. And we'll be right back. After Here's a clip from our next episode. So you're thinking about registering for the Task Management and Time Blocking Virtual Summit. Or maybe you've already registered. You want to make the most of the experience a learning experience like any growth opportunity that life presents you. But you want to make sure that you choose wisely. Why? Well, there's more to do, more to see in terms of videos, more people to meet, more conversations to have than you can do in the three days that we've allowed for. Even if you don't get much sleep, how can you make the most out of the event? In this short episode, I'll let you know how you can maximize the opportunity. It's the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast. And today I'm talking about the Task Management and Time Blocking Virtual Summit. Coming up on March 3rd to 5th, 2022. And if you want to leave a comment about this episode or any aspect of the work that we're doing here at the Task Management and Time Blocking Podcast, you can go over to www.replytofrancis.info and send me either a message uh, by text or send me a voice message, a voice note. And as you probably know, we have a couple of places that you can interact with other people, talk about this episode. One is at the community, mightytaskers.scheduleu.org, and you'll see the link in the show notes. And the other, of course, is our upcoming Task Management and Time Blocking Summit coming up in March. Two outstanding opportunities to interact with other people about the ideas that you've heard on this podcast or any of your episodes that are coming up. And if you'd like to support the work we're doing, I invite you to click on the Patreon link below to make a donation. And please don't forget to like our show and recommend it to others on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, or whatever past podcast app or service you're using. This is Francis Wade. I'm signing out. I hope to see you on a future episode and until then, take care and all the best. See you later.